This video will cover sections 2.3 and 3.5, which discusses errors and power. Recall from section 2.1 that simple random samples will produce statistics that are, on average, close to the value of the parameter. However, it is possible to get an unusual sample, one that is not representative of the population, even using unbiased sampling methods, and we'll never know if our sample is an unusual one or not. What happens in this situation? We make a bad decision, or what's called an error. This is not a mistake in our research. The term error refers to a decision we make about the null hypothesis. First, some terminology. Significance level is an arbitrary cutoff set by the researcher when writing the hypotheses that will distinguish between a low p-value and a high p-value. We use the notation alpha, the Greek letter for A, to denote our significance level, and the most commonly used significance levels are 0.01, 0.05, or 0 0.10, in other words, 1, 5, or 10 percent. Your significance level, by definition, is controlling the probability of mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis. Remember, a low p-value provides strong evidence against the null, so if our p-value is lower than alpha, we say we have strong enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value, on the other hand, is larger than alpha, that's a high p-value which does not provide strong evidence, and therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis are what we call decisions. These decisions are where an error would occur in the event of an unusual or non-representative sample. There are two types of errors in statistics. A type 1 error is when the decision is to reject the null hypothesis, even though the null hypothesis is true. Your book terms a type 1 error a false alarm. A type 2 error is if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, even though the null is false. And your book calls this a missed opportunity. This table summarizes what was just stated in words. A few important notes about errors. What is true, the null hypothesis, or the alternative, is unknown to us. This is what is actually going on in the population. Our decisions are based on our data and reference the relationship between our p-value and the stated significance level. Finally, what you decide and what is true must be opposite things in an error. When you're interpreting errors, you need to be clear with what the decision was and how that is different from reality. Next, we will provide some examples of interpretations of errors in a few different contexts. In medical tests, for example, the null hypothesis is that someone is healthy, and the alternative is that they have the disease or are sick. A type 1 error, then, would be a false positive if we conclude someone has the disease, even though they don't. A type 2 error is a false negative, when we conclude someone does not have a disease, when they actually do. In table form, again, the null hypothesis is that someone is healthy, and the alternative is that the person is sick. We can either decide to reject the null and have a t positive test based on our data, or we can decide that the test is negative and fail to reject the null. A positive test when the person is healthy is a false positive. That's a type 1 error. A negative test when the person is sick is a false negative or a type 2 error. Another common way to think about errors is in our judicial system. Remember innocent until proven guilty, so our null hypothesis in our jury system is that the defendant is innocent, and the alternative hypothesis is that the defendant is guilty. A type 1 error, then, is to convict an innocent man, and a type 2 is to acquit someone who is guilty. Again, using the table to demonstrate this, the null hypothesis is that the person is innocent, the alternative is that the person is guilty, and then we can either convict them, rejecting the null, or acquit them, failing to reject the null. 
Convicting someone who is innocent would be a type 1 error. Acquitting someone who is guilty, a type 2. From this scenario, what are the observational units? What are the variable or variables collected? Is each variable categorical or quantitative? What would a type 1 and type 2 error mean in the context of this problem? Pause the video as you answer these questions, then play the video to see the solutions. The observational units here are the physicians that we collected data from. We collected two variables from each physician, whether they used aspirin or not, and whether they had a heart attack or not. The null hypothesis is that aspirin doesn't help prevent heart attacks, and the alternative is that aspirin does help prevent heart attacks, in which case our decisions would either be to reject the null and conclude that aspirin helps, that aspirin does help prevent heart attacks, or fail to reject the null and conclude that aspirin does not help prevent heart attacks. A type 1 error would be telling people to take aspirin even though it doesn't help them. A type 2 error would be concluding that aspirin does not help even though it does, in which case aspirin could be saving lives even though we don't recognize the benefits. Notice the additional column and row at the end of the table. Errors are conditional on our decisions as well as the truth. So when we reject the null, the only error that could have occurred is type 1. When we fail to reject the null, the only error that could have occurred is type 2. Similarly, if we were to know the truth, that the null is true and that aspirin doesn't help prevent heart attacks, then only a type 1 error is possible versus if the alternative is true and aspirin does help prevent heart attacks, the only potential error is type 2. Finally, let's discuss the power of the test or the probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. In table form, we would have to reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis be false in order to consider the power of the test. Note that power is the probability of the correct decision, so power is actually a value between 0 and 1, as opposed to types of errors which are events that could occur. However, we can talk about the probability of those types of errors as well. Remember the significance level alpha was controlling the probability of mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis. Well, mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis actually is a type 1 error, and therefore the significance level, alpha, is the probability of making a type 1 error, or the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. We don't have a notation for the probability of a type 2 error, but note that power, which is the probability of rejecting the null when the null is false, and type 2 error rate, which is the probability of failing to reject the null when the null is false, must add to 1. Because we've conditioned on the same event, that the null is false in both power and type 2 error, but we have the complementary decisions of rejecting or failing to reject the null. Lastly, we looked at what influences the probability of these errors. Clearly, since the probability of a type 1 error is our significance level, alpha will be the only influence on the probability of a type 1 error. However, type 2 error is tied to power, so all of those things that we saw that affect power will also affect the probability of a type 2 error. So a larger sample size, which gave us more power, which gi will give us a lower probability of a type 2 error. A larger significance level, which gave us more power, will lead to a lower type 2 error rate. And a larger distance between the hypothesized null value and the true or expected parameter will give us more power, again leading to a lower probability of a type 2 error. We've concluded in this class that larger samples tend to be better because they reduce variability, even if they don't impact our bias. However, there comes a point where a sample can become too large.
Because the p-value tends to be smaller with larger sample sizes, it can happen that when the sample size is so large, we could get results deemed statistically significant, even though the results are not practically important. Statistically significant just means that we've rejected the null hypothesis, or that our p-value is less than the significance level. Practically important means the results are meaningful in real life, and that people could make decisions based on the results of the data. As an example, children often run fevers after a vaccination. It's part of the immune response, and of course, getting a shot hurts. Some pediatricians would suggest parents give their child a dose of Tylenol to help reduce these adverse side effects of a vaccination. That was until a study of a large number of children showed the number of antibodies created in children who took Tylenol was significantly lower than among those who did not. The moral of the research was don't give Tylenol, but someone checked further. The antibody levels, while lower in the Tylenol group, were still above the desired level to become immune to the disease. In other words, the child still wouldn't get sick from the disease, even though the antibody counts were lower. So while the antibody counts were significantly lower, with a low p-value, in the Tylenol group, the children who took Tylenol still developed immunization and had fewer negative side effects in regards to temperature and poor temperament following the vaccination. This study has significant results, but it is unlikely to make you not give your child Tylenol before a vaccination and therefore has no practical importance. Note that this can go in the other direction as well. Studies could have practical importance without statistical significance. Again, this is usually tied to sample size. The situation can happen in the case of a small sample size or in a study without enough power.